livelihood in my understanding is really your ability to afford the basic necessities to be able to provide good education for yourself and your family access to proper health care access to disposable income to afford food and all the other necessities and also some money to save and invest digitalization has really become a buzzword in ghana and the question is are we able to learn online are we able to take more businesses online? What value does it provide to Ghanaians? If you check the poverty map for Ghana, you will realize that the people classified or the zone classified as the poorest of the poor are all at the coastal areas. And what do these guys do? What do they have in common? Fishing and fish. And how come this ocean with a lot of fish and we individuals are even buying so expensive that we even hardly even get some to buy? They are not even living like well enough. So we want to change that narrative. Tora me as I'm tora me 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 he should be bad. Oh yeah, I'm 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 Rafi, <laughs> Wouldn't you make a problem, my book? If a problem, my book, Antonio, no. Tell us, Minister, like take any beer. Don't want to make a way, a grouper, a low touch as an Indian grouper. My name is Samuel Samson Nanso, uh, the co-founder and then uh, director of operations for uh, Inshanam, Ghana. What we do is that we work with artisanal fishermen. We just take their catch from them straight, cutting the whole middle chain, the middle man, the fish mummies, and then we are sending it to the wider market. Oh, okay. Oh, I We are using a technology which is basically an app we, we co-design and build with the fishermen. Once fishermen come in with, let's say, grouper, cassava fish, barracuda, they just go onto the app, they log in, and then all they have to do is just tap, 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 and they just enter the name of the fisherman, the telephone number of the fisherman, and then they click send. They go me, come and hold you again. First, they don't go with this, they come and hold you, they go, they look, 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 they Oh, 
fe go no ba chun le be se na mo wa chun ni no we go mu chun ni ke je pi ke je pi po ni fi opo I love so many different things about Ghana. I'm a proud Ghanaian. I love the creativity and the, the, the tenacity of the African spirit or the Ghanaian spirit. My name is Regina Honu and I'm the CEO of Shonko Academy. We teach different skills, mostly digital and technical skills, targeted at women and girls. So for me, I think if you look at the essential skills, there's reading, writing, literacy, and I think now coding is like the fourth one. It's the language of the future. When I started off my journey of founding the company, one of the first problems I was trying to solve was to change the single story. So that was my first goal. So Sronko means unique in my local language, which is tree. So we wanted to provide unique solutions, you know, to the challenge of getting more women into the technology space. And also we connect them to dignified and fulfilling work. Entrepreneurship is growing in Ghana. Over the past three or four years, uh, there have been a, a lot of hubs supporting young people to go into entrepreneurship. So there are lots of young entrepreneurs Sometimes entrepreneurship can seem like a very lonely journey. Um, and for me, meeting other young entrepreneurs inspires me to understand that I'm not alone. It allows me to also learn from their experiences and, and sort of engage with somebody who, who gets it. Because sometimes when you speak to other people that are not entrepreneurs, they may not necessarily understand. Then we are now getting into the genesis of Inshanam. Uh, yes, I think we should start. We can start getting into it since... Yes, I was born in the coastal city. Okay. Like, uh, I was born at Teshi. Okay. All right? Uh, you, you, we used to go to the seaside to go and buy fish, you know, any day at all. Like, as, as I choose this, where, 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 where the fishermen don't go to sea. But mostly on Saturdays, Saturday mornings, you find us at the beach buying fish and all of those things. Going up there, and then even now going back there to see what I see there, you realize that no, it's, it's something has to change. Yes, yeah, something really has to change. Something really has to change because you, you can see that the, their livelihoods has not improved. It's rather going down, and then uh, it, it's really not not not, not the on. best. Okay. Now, as you explained the model, I heard about the middlemen. Can you tell me more about the middlemen? What do they do in the value chain of fishing? You have, the, let's say, a dealer. You have a bulk dealer. You have maybe a wholesaler and then a retailer, all right? So those chain, those chain of people are all present here now. So you have the fishermen bring in the catch to either the canoe owner, who then sells it on to a fish mummy, who is probably like a bulk supplier, okay. who supplies to other dealers. Why do all these processes have to happen? Why can't the retailer just go straight to the fisherman? That seems to be um, uh, a question that I, I'm sure if I had an answer to, <laughs> I, I would have been very rich. Okay. You know, in the sense that you realize that uh, it, it's like a communal thing. Okay. So uh, we are basically trying to cut off that middle chain, taking it directly from the fisherman to the end the, consumer. The end consumer. Change is difficult, and I think Nshonam is in a space that is rooted in culture and tradition. This is where I see his biggest challenge. 
to be able to introduce technology without upsetting the balance, without making uh, the fisher community feel like, what is this alien new thing that's coming in to disrupt how things have been done and how things have been passed on. I really like that Inshanam understands how to bring convenience to the end user, which is people like me and you know other businesses. When I started off my journey of founding the company, I wanted Africans to be able to solve their own problems and to be able to export innovation to the rest of the world. And for me, one of the things that I realized was that technology was really going to be a tool that will help us. So if you look at the ecosystem in Ghana, when people talk about digitalization, they are mostly talking about mobile money, being able to use the phones. I think it goes beyond that. So are we able to automate government? Are we able to go from just local exporting to global? So are we able to export not only our natural resources, but also our key resources, which is our human capital? So I think it goes past just the smartphone. There are several areas, if it's done well, can really spotlight Ghana. As a third world country, Ghana has been quite peaceful and politically, economically stable. However, I feel like the skyline of development is running behind schedule when it comes to the fast growing economy pace. So I envision to revolutionize development in Ghana by industrialization. I mean, you have a global perspective. So where do you see the role of digitalization in the vision of Africa? I mean, the biggest drug in this world today, funny enough, is Wi-Fi. A child needs it, a mother needs it, a father needs it, uh, slim, young, fat, whatever, they all need it. And so we are moving quite fast with technology and technology is bridging with industrialization. And so that's why I built the Freedom Coin. Um, I knew that there was a future for that kind of currency in terms of digitization. And I saw the vision with African free trade. I realized that the next biggest thing that will help this free trade to trade among 54 countries and do cross-border movements with different currencies would only be through blockchain. The Freedom uh, Network, it's supposed to be one of Africa's number one blockchain that I'm partnering with people from all over the world. We wanna build, you know, a blockchain development centers. And we want Ghana to be the headquarters of this. I think currently one of the main challenges that we have having such a youthful population is the youth are dissolution. The they are losing hope, they want to give up. I want to make sure that we're empowering young people to believe in Ghana and believe in, you know, things made here and things from here and to want to stay and make Ghana better. Why don't we bring all the opportunities that seem to be concentrated in Accra? Why don't we share development across board? My name is Mause Christina Jisong. I am the CEO of Summer Life. I came to the region when I was nine years, the Upper West region, which is the poorest region in Ghana. At that time, I got my first contact with rural women who travel from 
their various communities and walk for 35 kilometers to sell their produce. Then I felt like I want to do something about it when I grow up. We work with women within the share value chain where they produce quality share butter and share products like soaps and lotion for exports. The business idea of Soma Life is we want to ensure that we bring these women and their households above the poverty line. We all know that there are some people who go to bed not knowing where their next meal for the few days will come from. And that is wrong. This is the first stage of share butter processing. When the nuts is picked, the women have to salt it. And how, how, how can you tell when the nut is bad? Like It's usually very dark, black, and has some uh, lice in it. So you have to remove the lice and any other thing that you don't want in the butter. Wow. Yes. This thing is very important. It will determine the, the quality of the nut you, uh, the butter you have at the end of the day. We believe strongly that rural share producers should not continue to live on less than $2 daily. They account for a $1.9 billion share industry. So we combine access to resources like logistics, machineries to improve their production process, trainings, and conservation. It's softer than cocoa butter. Cocoa butter is harder. <laughs> yes, so oh, that's the final wow. stage. Beautiful. I love how you go from this to this. Yes. And then you have, and then now it's ready for packaging yes, and right. selling. Yeah. yeah. Hanging out with the women, I see how tedious the work is from stage one to stage 100. <laughs> you know, it seems like there are 100 stages. Yeah, what is in it for the women? For instance, last year, we engaged over uh, 2,000 women, mm. and we set the target that by the end of the year, they should get 18% additional income. Mm. So we target buyers who care about sustainability. So together with them, we agree that this is the amount you should buy this tonnage of share, nuts or butter, and then when we, they do that, that money goes to add up to what the, the women will get at the end of the day. And how do you attract your international clients? Like, how do you get buyers to come in and know about Summer Life and want to purchase your products? Yeah, so uh, that's why I was taking the videos and okay. the pictures. We have two uh, customer segments. We have the retailers and the manufacturers. So the retailers are usually people that we find through uh, the social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram. So we put the pictures there, we promote our products on these social media platforms and we attract that customer segment. And most of them are in Europe and Asia. <laughs> I have not understood the definition of hard work until I met those women. I don't even think I fully appreciated my privilege till I met those women. Oh 
I'm impressed that Summer Life is making a difference. I'm impressed that it's led by a young dynamic lady like Mousy and what she does from training to using social media to market and brand her products to creating these well-branded samples uh, that she distributes. And I'm impressed that she has a really amazing story to it. There's something you think we should do about the quality or something, like even the packaging. Do you think it's eco-friendly for the EU market? I think like if we put the air, we write the name of the community that produces this stuff, mm. it will help. Yeah. yeah, and to also help with traceability, yeah. buyers can all easily know where yeah, it is coming yeah, from yeah, in case yeah. they want to maybe yeah. help that community, yeah. they can just walk there and do something, that's fine. Yes, yeah, so maybe I can just show you uh, some of the pictures of my trip in Germany. Okay. One of the reasons I went there is to also learn how the German market um, regulates the cosmetic and the food ingredients that come from Africa. Mm -hmm. And I went for um, a trade fair as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a trade fair in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So I went there to meet buyers. We started signing contracts with them and also they, they are careful about certification, so we have to get our certification ready before we can serve them. When I look at the Upper West region, I can see that, first of all, the social development kick was not shared equally. I'm still surprised that in some places, you know, you have to walk some places to charge your mobile phone or to just get access to light which I think in the 21st century is not a luxury item, but a key necessity. I really see so much resources, but it's missing the opportunity piece. When I first started my journey of wanting to become a computer scientist, I studied in Ashesu University. When I graduated, the only mentors that I knew of, especially within the tech space, were Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Those were the only two. I didn't know any women. This is my first office, so um, when I started to think about starting a business and started conceptualizing Stronko, um, I had to move back home to stay with my parents because I, I couldn't afford to have an own, my own apartment. And my father had free internet in the house. When I decided I wanted to start my own business, I was really concerned about how my parents would react. My dad was always on board because my father felt that I was being held back in terms of what I could do. So what are your future plans? How do you, how do you see yourself? In? <sighs> future Ten plans? Years, yes. Mm. It seems like opportunity is just centered in Accra, Kumasi, yeah. Cape Coast. But young people outside, it's like nothing is happening yeah. for them. So I really want to do more for, especially women and girls outside, bring more opportunities for them, um, and then um, set up a bigger space here, and then maybe satellite spaces across, yeah. you know. So I always answer this because people ask me, do I think about expanding into other countries and all of that? Mm. But for me, I'm very keen on deepening my impact in Ghana. Yeah. I still want to make sure that, you know, um, women coders or women in technology is normal in Ghana. <laughs> yeah. I'm starting a small business in uh, production of natural hair care products. So I want to go a bigger, but I'll be making it international. This is data analytics. If my company gets bigger, I should be able to understand what data I acquire and how to make use of the data to improve my business. Here in the mindset, when you want to do coding, they all see it to be difficult, and being a woman, people think you can't do it. So when I told my family about it, they were happy, at least you are going to explore to get the knowledge, and doing something like this will help me. I'm a true child of Ghana. 
I love that there's potential everywhere. Because we have so many challenges, there's also the opportunity to provide solutions. So I like that each challenge provides an opportunity to do something new and innovative. It also challenges you to think outside of the box and come up with something different. Ghana is developing in the right direction. The challenge is the pace. So I feel we could have done so much more by now. And given the fact that we are a democratic nation, an English-speaking nation, we have a lot of natural resources, and we have a great youthful population. And I think if anybody can do it, Ghana can. <laughs>